Now, if Earth's history were a movie, we humans would only take up the last second of the end credits. Our planet has been around for about 4.6 billion years, but our human story began about 300,000 years ago, in Africa. Now our ancestors had some wild adventures in nature. They could have run into creatures so big, they'd make today's elephants look like puppies. The woolly mammoth is a pretty famous animal, sure. His cousin, though, the Colombian mammoth, not so much. This giant used to roam places from Canada all the way down to Mexico. Unlike the furrier woolly mammoths, which hung out in colder places, these animals had shorter hair, resembling huge elephants. They also had incredibly large tusks, like 12 feet worth of spiraling sturdy tusks. And they weren't just for show, they came in handy when facing predators. That includes our ancestors. If you think about sloths these days, you're picturing these adorably slow creatures. They couldn't possibly be in your list of most dangerous animals. Well, their grandparents might have. For starters, we call them ground sloths, and they vary a lot in size. Some were as big as rhinos, and others, like the megatherium, were as colossal as elephants. Imagine seeing a 20-foot-long sloth which doesn't mind chewing on some meat every now and then. At least in theory. Ever heard of Bigfoot? Well, our next animal kind of looks like him, but is a distant cousin to orangutans. Meet Gigantopithecus, the largest primate to ever call our planet its home. Standing tall at 10 feet and weighing more than 600 pounds, these animals were amazing to look at in real life. Unlike Bigfoot, they weren't constantly hiding. In fact, it's believed they were peaceful and gentle creatures. Sadly, they faded away about 100,000 years ago, mainly because their food sources slowly became unavailable. Those lush, fruity forests they called home eventually turned into dry grasslands. Next on our list is the cave hyena. Weighing a chunky 250 pounds and standing 3 feet tall, these beasts were as long as a grown-up lying down. What's even more interesting about these creatures is that they loved hanging out in groups. A pack could be as big as 30 of these animals, which meant they could easily take on even the biggest, heaviest mastodons. Our ancient families would have needed to stay alert around these hungry specimens. Sadly for these hyenas about 20,000 years ago, their numbers started going down. Soon enough, they completely disappeared from the planet. Quick pop quiz. What's called a tiger but isn't really one? It's the saber-toothed tiger. I mean, sure, they belong to the feline family, but they aren't technically tigers. First appearing around 42 million years ago, in July, I think, many of their kind were gone before we even showed up. However, early Americans might have bumped into a couple of specimens from this group. If that really happened, it would have been quite the encounter. Think of the biggest wild lion today or the hefty Siberian tiger. These big cats also had some incredible features hidden in their fur. They were good at sneaking around, hiding, and pouncing on mammoths bigger than themselves. Their bite wasn't that strong, but they could open their jaws wide, like twice as much as a lion. And although their teeth were a bit on the weak side, they had buff forearms to pin down their dinner, giving those big fangs a purpose. Not the kind of kitty you'd want to play with. Dire wolves made their debut about 250,000 years ago. They were like the gray wolves we know today, but a lot stronger. While wolves these days stretch out to about 6 feet and tip the scales at 170 pounds max, dire wolves were about 5 feet and about 150 pounds. Found all over North and South America, they had admirable jaws biting nearly a third harder than their modern counterparts. Also, their favorite snack was horses. But just like many other majestic beasts of the past, they faded away around 10,000 years ago. Now, names can be deceiving. Take the American lion, for example. It's not really a lion, it's more of a panther's big cousin. The other part of the name is correct, though. They did live in America about 330,000 years ago. This feline was no lap cat either. They were at the top of the wildcat pyramid, weighing a colossal 772 pounds. That's like stacking four grown men on a scale. Even the mighty African lion would look a tad bit shy beside these beasts. 
with the muscle to take down a bison, you wouldn't want to accidentally interrupt their dinner. They parted ways with this planet around 11,000 years ago, right after the last ice age. Now, down in Australia, about 50,000 years ago, I wasn't around then, there lurked a relative of the Komodo dragon, the Megalania. Experts love to have debates on how big it was. Some say it stretched out to 23 feet. Others think it was just about 11 feet long. Either way, they were basically mega-sized Komodo dragons with a dangerous bite. If you think bears are already big and fluffy now, let's introduce the short-faced bear. While this big creature stood on its hind legs, it towered at 14 feet. With long limbs, they could outrun today's bears, hitting speeds up to 40 miles per hour. These ultra bears sadly disappeared around 11,600 years ago. Now imagine a crocodile. Okay, imagine that same crocodile, only supersized, with sporty legs doing its thing in Australia about 1.6 million years ago. Well, say hello to the Quincana. These crocs were extremely large, reaching 23 feet. And no, they weren't lazy river loungers. These creatures really love spending time on land. They evolved to have strong legs for their chases and razor-sharp teeth designed for slicing, not gripping. When did we stop sharing beaches with them? About 40,000 years ago. The name elephant bird might not sound familiar, but try to picture a bird that stood tall as high as a basketball hoop at 10 feet and weighed as much as a small car, 1,500 pounds. Their eggs were equally huge, like 150 chicken eggs bundled up into one. Now, as amazing as these birds sound, there's a lot we still don't know about them. They're hard to study, as most extinct animals are. Still, some recent studies have given us some clues. Scientists have been examining ancient molecules from their fossilized eggshells. It's an awesome piece of evidence, since these birdie shells were thick, preserving precious DNA inside. Plus, there are tons of these eggshell fragments sprinkled all over Madagascar's beaches. Because of these findings, we now know these birds were herbivores and loved eating leaves and seeds. We also know the tiny kiwi bird is its closest living relative. Now, dodos were these amazing birds we also used to share the planet with. They're like distant cousins to Asian pigeons. To give you some perspective, imagine a chunky bird weighing about 50 pounds. Similar to chickens, turkeys, and ostriches, dodos were also the types of birds that couldn't fly. Their wings were small, and they had the muscle strength of, well, a wet noodle. Now, you might have heard the word dodo used as a name for creatures that aren't that bright. Don't get confused, though, by this name. These birds were, in fact, intelligent. Scientists were able to figure that out by studying their fossils. It turns out that they were good at smelling stuff, unlike most birds that are all about the visuals. These creatures aren't around for us to study anymore, but that might change. One evolutionary biologist is on a mission to fully understand these amazing ancient birds. On that note, she revealed that the dodo's DNA has been completely sequenced. There are even talks about potentially bringing dodos back to life. They would make a nice addition to the lovely beaches of Mauritius, the place they used to call home many, many years ago. How heavy is the largest living snake? How can a snake eat a whale? Get ready, I'm about to answer these questions. Before the last ice age, giant mammals like mammoths ruled the world. The modern animal kingdom we're familiar with was shaped around 55 million years ago. I mean, there were still 1,000-pound bear dogs living from Asia to America. But modern whales, for instance, began to appear later. I'm saying modern whales because, surprise, surprise, whales weren't always fully aquatic. The ancestors of the ocean's biggest animals once walked on dry land. They had four legs and lived on the coast. Now, I want to introduce you to a snake that used to eat these whales, the Palaeophys, a genus of a marine snake. Scientists say it's hard to understand how big the Palaeophys was due to its fragmentary fossil record. They assume that it could have reached up to 40 feet long. Its fossils were found in different parts of the world, from England to Morocco and Virginia, USA. 
the filet is extinct now. And sea snakes today are only about a quarter of the size this majestic creature used to be. So no need to worry about this underwater monster. But there once was an even bigger snake, the Titan Boa. It was around 50 feet long and most likely weighed over a ton. It used to live in what is now known as northeastern Colombia around 60 to 58 million years ago. Scientists say that it mostly fed on fish. Another giant animal that lived in the past was the black Gigantopithecus. These primates aren't related to gorillas. They lived in the area of modern China. Some people believe that they're still alive, but so far, no one has laid eyes on them. Some people even go further and say that the stories of Bigfoot or Yeti are based on these animals. This rodent became extinct about 2 million years ago. Its main habitat was South America, more specifically, Uruguay. What's astonishing about this species is that it was the largest rodent ever known. It was bigger than a bull. Scientists believe that it weighed up to 1,000 pounds. A distant relative of this rodent is still alive today. It's called the Pacarana. It's a rare animal that lives in South America. It weighs up to 33 pounds and measures up to 31 inches, not including its cute and fluffy tail. The Arthropleura was an insect that lived in prehistoric times. Imagine a giant millipede measuring up to 8 feet in length. Here you go. It was one of the largest land animals of its era, about 315 million years ago. The Arthropleura's shell was covered with tough plates. These plates were there to protect the creature from damage. Most of the time, it burrowed into the ground to avoid becoming some other animal's dinner. Meet the Megalodon. Millions of years ago, this shark lived in the ocean and ate other marine creatures. It had wide teeth and its jaws were so powerful that the animal could finish off its prey with the force of its bite. It was one of the largest sharks to ever exist. Yet, this predator also went extinct. Scientists don't really know the reason. This made me wonder why animals were so big in the past. Nowadays, smaller creatures flee or hide from predators. But apparently, it wasn't like this before. Many centuries ago, animals didn't just run or hide, they fought back. Research suggests that this behavior may have been the most important motivation for prey to grow bigger. A study compared the skulls of ancient animals to those of their modern peers. The skulls of predatory animals have become shorter and narrower, while the skulls of the animals they hunted have become longer and broader. This means that predators learned to become experts in hunting, while prey worked on developing their defense skills. You see, a larger body size was a great advantage because it made it harder for predators to take down the animals they hunted. The bottom line? Self-defense made prehistoric animals larger. The second reason why ancient animals were larger is related to their bones. They had hollow bones, which are lighter than solid bones. This type of bone allowed large animals to move quickly. Let's take sauropods. They were a dinosaur subgroup. Sauropods had giraffe-like long necks and snake-like long tails. Compared to their body size, their head was really tiny. But since their bones were quite light, they could move around without having to carry additional weight. The eating habits of these animals were also related to their body size. When experts examined the fossils of one extinct mammal species, they found out that these animals had a diet that was high in nutrients and low in fiber. And this mammal was the largest land animal of its period. In other words, following this diet, mammals could grow to be very large. There was plenty of food out there, so they didn't have to worry about finding it. Fun fact, these animals also took chewing out of the picture. They could swallow their food in large pieces instead of taking small bites. Environmental conditions also played an important role in the evolution of larger animals in prehistoric times. Those animals tended to live in warm, moist climates that provided them with a lot of food. They didn't have to compete for food sources. Researchers believe that because of these conditions, natural selection worked in a certain way. 
I mean, body size was more important than such traits as agility and speed. Oh, and did you know that large animals tend to produce more carbon dioxide? And ultimately, a bigger volume of carbon dioxide increases the amount of vegetation in the animal's habitat. As for the abundance of oxygen in the atmosphere at that time, it could be another vital element for some animal's growth. A good but scary example of an animal that benefited from the high levels of oxygen can be the cockroach of the Paleozoic era. At that time, cockroaches were the size of modern house cats. Now this one would give me the chills if I ever faced it. Ugh. What about today? Well, there are over 3,000 species of snakes on Earth. The smallest snake in the world is the Barbados thread snake. It's only around 4 inches long when fully grown. And the largest one? It's the reticulated python. This snake reaches around 20 feet in length. The longest python was discovered in 1912. It measured 32 feet long. As for the largest and heaviest reticulated python, it was named Medusa. Medusa was approximately 25 feet long and weighed 350 pounds. These reptiles lived in Southeast Asia in rainforests, woodlands, and grasslands. Don't be confused though, the reticulated python isn't the heaviest snake in the world. This title belongs to the green anaconda. It weighs approximately 500 pounds. Green anacondas are found in South America and Trinidad in damp, humid areas. I have a bonus for you. Here is a flying snake. You can find these snakes in Southeast Asia. They don't fly like birds, of course, but they do use the power of flight. They can go as high as 300 feet. They leap from tree branches into the air. Once they take off, it's all about aerodynamics. Their main technique is flaring their ribs and pulling in their abdomens. While airborne, they undulate from one side to another and slightly up and down. This motion helps snakes to turn and glide. Why bother with all this if they can just crawl in an old school way? Scientists aren't sure, but they believe it might be related to escaping from predators. This way, they move from one tree to another without having to get down to the ground. Every now and then, people discover fossils of animals that lived millions of years ago. These ancient discoveries continue to capture our imagination. Which of these animals would you like to see alive? Researchers have been waiting for this find for a long time. They came in all shapes and sizes. It would have been hard to distinguish them from dinosaurs. Most species weren't bigger than a mouse. It's like a reminder of a long-gone era when its ancestors walked on all fours. The first mammals to walk the Earth were different from us humans in one important aspect. We walk on two legs. That makes us bipedal. But the first animals that made the transition from sea to land were tetrapods. This means they walked on four legs. The story of these creatures began in present-day Scotland. The region is home to the first terrestrial ecosystem in the world. The rock here is made from silica. This material is the building block of glass. Hot volcanic springs formed these rocks more than 400 million years ago. Such land composition is a treasure trove for paleontologists. These are the scientists who study the fossil remains of animals and plants. In Scotland, they found everything from plants with preserved cells to the oldest known fossils of insects. They even discovered a fungus that grew up to 29 feet tall. But there was one find that stood out from all the other ones. In 2015, scientists unearthed fossils of four-legged animals. The place of discovery was Willie's Hole, near the hillside village of Chernside in the south of the country. Researchers dated the finds to the Paleozoic era, about 360 million years ago. This was the time when the early ancestors of the dinosaurs thrived. The world was a much different place back then. Today, we associate Scotland with cold and rain, and kilts and golf. But at that time, this land sat closer to the equator. It had lush vegetation, and its climate was hot and humid. Droughts and flooding were quite common. It was the perfect setting for an important evolutionary event. 
Researchers have been waiting for this find for a long time. The fossil records had a 15 million year gap. Its name was Romer's Gap, after the Harvard professor who described it. Science was missing fossil evidence of the animals that ventured onto land on all fours. The five fossil species they found in Scotland shed light on this mystery. The first tetrapods were divided into two large groups. One of them contained the ancestors of birds, reptiles, and mammals. Their collective name is Amniotis. The other included the ancestors of amphibians, such as frogs. When these and similar species migrated to dry land, they discovered that they weren't alone. The earliest life forms that made this evolutionary leap were liverwort-like plants. We know this because scientists found their spores. They also discovered fossilized remains of an air-breathing millipede. It had tiny holes that allowed it to breathe air. This puts it among the first oxygen-breathing animals on the planet. And this species of millipedes is the first land-dweller in the animal kingdom. Today, the largest of such creatures is the African elephant. Scientists believe that one of the first four-legged creatures to make it onto land was an amphibian ancestor. Its name was Istiostega. The first part of the animal's name translates from ancient Greek as fish. This reveals a lot about the way the creature moved. It dragged itself on the ground using only its front limbs that resembled fins. This is the way that mudskipper fish move on land today. This isn't how we imagine proper walking, but during the period our hero lived on Earth, it was the perfect way to get around. The climate had both extremely dry and wet periods. The ability to walk and swim at the same time was especially useful. The fossils from Scotland supported this claim. The fish-like animals scientists found had four slender limbs. This is the perfect equipment for life on land, not inside the ocean. There was further evidence. The fossils displayed well-developed lungs for breathing outside of water. But their legs were still too weak to completely lift the body off the ground. The tail section had to slither along the surface, similar to how a snake moves forward. This animal that resembled a modern-day salamander lived during the Paleozoic era. This was the time when four-legged creatures developed a standard number of digits at the end of their hands and feet, five on each. We know them today as fingers. All species that had more than five fingers started slowly disappearing. These pteropods split into two groups. The first of them had to return to the sea to lay eggs. This group would later give rise to amphibians. The second kind of tetrapods is more interesting to human evolution. They're considered the ancestors of reptiles, dinosaurs, and mammals. The Permian period came at the end of the Paleozoic. By this time, all life forms on Earth inhabited the supercontinent of Pangaea. There were vast deserts far away from the oceans. The more important species that walked on all fours during this time were the synapsids. They came in all shapes and sizes. But the only subgroup of synapsids to survive into the Cenozoic were the mammals. Doesn't seem like much, but we exist today thanks to these ancient tetrapods. As a species, we have come far in the tree of life. A recent study revealed that the first life form to evolve was an ocean-drifting comb jelly. This came as a bit of a surprise. For a long time, researchers believed that the simple sponge was the oldest animal on the planet. After analyzing vast amounts of data, comb jelly came on top. Or the bottom, depending on how you look at the tree of life. These ancient beings were squishy and had tentacles, but they weren't the true jellyfish like the ones we see today. The creatures lacked the bell-shaped body and stinging cells. Scientists cannot precisely date the species because they lack a fossil of the oldest comb jelly. This is not the case with other ancient creatures that once roamed our planet. The ancestor of dinosaurs, turtles, and crocodiles are familiar to science. These are the animals that appeared during the Paleozoic era. This was a time when true tetrapods appeared. Paleontologists recognized them by two distinctive openings on each side of their skull. The first mammals that appeared during this era resembled reptiles. It would have been hard to distinguish them from dinosaurs. Some of them later evolved features we all know today. These include fur and a warm-blooded metabolism. They developed during the time when dinosaurs dominated Earth. 
That's why these first true mammals were small. Most species weren't bigger than a mouse. Their diet consisted of plants, as they were herbivores. Also, they were creatures of the night. During the day, they were mostly hiding underground. Now, this wasn't such a bad strategy. Some 66 million years ago, an asteroid fell on the Yucatan Peninsula in today's Mexico. And this spelled the end for dinosaurs. 75% of all species that lived on Earth at the time disappeared. The mammal's small size helped them survive and repopulate the planet. The era in the history of our planet that followed the Mesozoic was nicknamed the Age of the Mammals. The climate became warmer, so grasslands expanded. These were the ideal conditions for tetrapods to grow in size. Some mammals decided not to take this evolutionary path. Bats remained relatively small in size and took to the skies to join birds. And there are some tetrapods that return to the ocean. The most notable example are whales. Today, their closest living relatives are hippos. Both species are aquatic, but they develop this trait separately. The first whales were actually tetrapods. These were the most typical examples of four-legged land animals. If you saw them today, you would think they were oversized rats. That's what whales looked like some 50 million years ago. Paleontologists came to this conclusion in the 1980s by studying the skull of a now-extinct animal. It lived around the edge of a large, shallow ocean. At some point in history, it returned to the marine way of life. Its back legs devolve. But sometimes, biologists stumble upon a living specimen of a whale that still displays tiny hind limbs in its skeleton. It's like a reminder of a long-gone era when its ancestors walked on all fours. Not much happens in dark, murky ocean depths. It's mostly pretty quiet, with some smaller fish carefully passing by and probably hoping nothing big would grab them on their way. There's also a bigger fellow looking for plankton coming through every now and then. Suddenly, a giant beast comes out of nowhere. First, it's just a dark dot in the distance, until it gets closer. Oh, it's a great white shark. You can recognize its firm, dark gray body, white belly, and slanted head. These creatures have special cells in their skin called melanocytes that can make their color change to lighter or darker. This way, a shark can blend in with its surroundings, which is a nice ace up its sleeve and the reason why we barely even see one coming by. These predators can grow up to be more than 20 feet and weigh up to 5,000 pounds. Our fierce fella is just passing by looking for some lost fish that might wander around, if it gets lucky, directly into its mouth. But instead, a giant jagged tentacle comes out of nowhere. The Great White barely escaped it, and quickly swam a little further to see what was happening. A giant squid comes out of the depths. Its eyes, as large as dinner plates, are looking straight at the shark, while its soft body is getting closer. A challenging prey, but hey, why not try? Most of the time, these creatures eat shrimp, fish, and other squid, but sometimes they like to really treat themselves, so they go after small whales. A shark will do too. I know you'd expect these creatures to be way smaller. Or that's at least how I comfort myself when I swim a little further from the shore where my feet can't touch the bottom anymore. But they can weigh 600 pounds and be 40 feet long. The great white shark is the biggest predatory shark on our planet. Check out its long and sharp teeth. It definitely has the biggest smile down there in the ocean. Great whites have around 300 teeth, but they don't use most of them for biting. Instead, they have a special system where new teeth grow all the time because they need to replace the ones that get worn out or lost. And they have a really powerful bite, over 20 times stronger than ours. Considering all that, you might think a great white shark has nothing to be afraid of in the ocean. But, looking at its gigantic enemy, we can't be so sure of that anymore. Octopuses only have eight arms. Squids, too. But they also have two additional tentacles. 
They're similar to their arms, but suckers on the arms go along most of their length, while tentacles have suckers only at the ends. This squid has probably hundreds or even thousands of suckers. There are squids without these suction cups, but in that case, they have rotating hooks, or a combination where these two work together. Hooks catch prey, and suckers stick on it so it doesn't get away. Squids have teeth, too. Plus, they have this special part called a radula. It's like a tongue, but with teeth on it. The teeth are tightly packed together and are difficult to remove. When food is passed to the radula, the teeth chew it into small pieces. This is important because squids have sensitive body parts near their throat, so they need pieces of their food to be very small. Their bite may not be as strong as the great white sharks, but it's still quite powerful. For instance, way stronger than a lion's. They also have glands that produce venom and use their beaks and radula to inject the venom into their prey or a creature that's coming after them. Wow, these squids are really equipped better than expected. And they're also way longer than the great white, which gives the squid more room to attack it with its long tentacles from a distance and seize it. Giant squids usually live at depths of 2,950 feet, while great whites prefer to stay at depths of about 650 feet. But we'll try to keep the competition fair. Let's say these two meet in a territory where water pressure won't hurt or bother any of these animals. The great white is circling around the squid. It moves a bit faster than the squid. Its swimming speed can reach 25 miles per hour when the animal is submerged, and it also has short bursts of speed when it can move at 35 miles per hour. Giant squids move at around 25 miles per hour. Just for comparison, an average human swims at 2 miles per hour. But with its length, the giant squid has more room to attack the great white shark with its long tentacles from a distance. They can stretch for 33 feet to snatch the prey. And look, it's really trying. But it ain't that easy. Not only is the great white big and fast, but it also has special sensors called the ampullae of Lorenzini. It's a good tool to detect prey and generally stay safe in the ocean. But the squid is definitely no joke. It has activated its special defense mechanism and released thick black ink. The great white is confused. The ink is like a smoke screen, which gives the squid enough time to get away. The shark can't see its opponent anymore. The squid is getting closer, and the poor great white has no idea from which direction. It's time for the final move. Even if the great white manages to catch the squid, the squid can detach parts of its body as a last resort to protect itself. It can lose up to 10 body parts, unlike sharks. These predators can't lose any essential body parts because they won't survive. And look, the squid finally latches onto the shark. Its suction cups and the sharp beak that can pierce its prey make it nearly impossible for the shark to escape. They both disappear into a cloud of ink, the great white shark in one of the rare fights it can lose, and the giant squid ready for new conquests across the ocean. Aren't giant squids perfect for scary stories? In legends, there are often battles between humans and sea monsters. In the past, Norwegian sailors shared stories about sea creatures they encountered during their ocean travels. Over time, these stories grew to include creatures that were like giant islands with arms. And let's not forget about the Kraken. It's a legendary sea monster from Scandinavian stories that looked like an island, which was how it would trick sailors. The spooky stories say the beast was using its long tentacles to grab ships and drag them to their doom. And do you remember Jules Verne's novel 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which describes an encounter between a ship and a giant squid? In real life, giant squids don't eat humans, and they're not particularly interested in going after ships. However, not all the stories about these creatures attacking ships are made up. There are some reports. For example, in the 1930s, something attacked a Norwegian tanker, the Brunswick, three times. 
and yes, it was indeed the work of a giant squid. Fortunately, the squid couldn't grip onto the ship's steel hull, so it ended up getting caught in the propellers. But even though everything was okay in the end, just looking at this gigantic monster trying to take your ship down to the bottom must have been terrifying. We can laugh at stories about the Kraken until we're out there on our own. In 2003, a giant squid came closer to a French yacht that was participating in a sailing race. It couldn't cause any harm, so it eventually gave up. So, for now, the idea of a giant squid taking down a ship or boat remains a fictional story. Although they're certainly capable of trying. Okay, giant squids are big, but there's another creature from their family of cephalopods that can be even larger. It's called the Colossal Squid, and one that was found weighed 992 pounds. Hundreds of pounds more than the giant squid. 606 pounds and they can stretch their tentacles for up to 45 feet. Imagine, crying out to someone not knowing that they can't hear you. This is the story of the loneliest whale swimming in the oceans. Scientists can only refer to the whale as a 52 Hertz whale, or a 52 whale for short. They call it that because they picked up its sound pitch similar to a blue whale's frequency, which is between 10 and 39 Hertz. Whales, like many animals, communicate with frequencies only they can understand. This whale in particular is known as the only one of its kind, since no other whale produces the same frequency. It's almost like a ghost, since no one has ever seen this whale in person or through footage. We only have recordings via hydrophones. It's been swimming around for decades, and was first heard in the late 1980s, up until 2010. Scientists have been receiving the whale's cry in the Pacific Ocean yearly, from August to December. Between January and February, it moves out of range. Scientists are still wrapping their heads around what this whale could be. Some are saying that it could be a blue whale hybrid of some kind, while others are suggesting that it could simply be a blue whale, but with a special condition. Some think that the whale might not hear properly, or cannot hear at all. But the fact that the blue whale has been around for such a long time means it's most probably a healthy whale. We know that the whale resides somewhere in the North Pacific, but scientists still haven't seen it for the past 30 years. All we've been doing is collecting vocal recordings through its path, calling for another whale to answer. People discovered whale frequencies by accident. The U.S. leadership deployed a bunch of hydrophones across the ocean floor to listen to other incoming submarines. While it may have proven successful for them, it also caught various frequencies from the depths of the oceans. Monstrous sounds. They described them as deep, rumbling calls. For centuries, legendary creatures were thought to have roamed the deep, dark waters. Krakens, leviathans, and other scary aquatic beasts. Maybe the submarines first thought they were listening to one of the creatures, but the frequencies were later identified as the sound of blue and fin whales. Towards the end of the 1980s, researchers and scientists were granted access to use the hydrophone network specifically for whales. Scientists realized that they could capture the frequencies of almost all whales, and just the 52 hertz stood out. There was so much buzz around this whale that some people decided to make a documentary about it. People have always wondered if this whale would ever find the special one it's always been calling for. An albatross is one of the fastest animals on the planet and can travel far and wide with ease. But this one named Albert couldn't find love fast enough. For the last 50 years, scientists believe that Albert has flown the coast of Scotland searching for a mate. Sadly enough, all his potential matches won't be around for another 8,000 miles on the other side of the world. Its natural home isn't the coast of Scotland. So how did it end up there? Some believe that Albert was caught in the middle of a storm and was blown away from the equator in the South Atlantic somewhere in the 1960s. 
Since then, it's been stuck there with no place to go. Sure, these birds can travel, but not that far away. They'll need help from the right winds to go home. Albert has been looking for a mate for decades now. He has found shelter on a remote rocky outcrop between the Shetland Isles and the Outer Hebrides first, but now he lives in Bempton Cliffs. Scientists have noted that Albert has been wandering the skies of Scotland, knowing that this species of bird have a lifespan of about 70 years. Not all birds flock together. Albert has been trying desperately to make some friends with the other birds in the neighborhood, but with no luck. The albatross is native to the Falkland Islands, which is way off course of Scotland. It most likely won't go back home anytime soon. Lonesome George isn't a name anyone would like to have, but this Pinta Island tortoise from the Galapagos earned the title by literally being the last of its kind. The sad part of Lonesome George's tale is that his species were booming and thriving in the 19th century. Unfortunately, humans got in the way and their numbers dwindled. For a very long time, people thought that this animal was extinct until George was discovered in 1972. It drew a lot of attention from the media and press. They found out that Lonesome George was about 60 years old by then, so they decided to bring him to a zoo. So, for many years in captivity, Lonesome George would not have the freedom or the life he would always want. He was the very last of his species, so the scientists that held him captive only wanted him to mate with other species. But nothing happened. He sadly passed away after 2012, officially the last of its kind. Tuffy was the last of its kind, a rab's fringe-limbed tree frog. This species used to live freely in the rainforests of Panama, gliding from tree to tree. Just like Lonesome George, they took Tuffy into captivity to protect it from predators and from an infection that wiped out the rest of its kind. He was placed in a botanical garden in Atlanta in a gray shipping container. He passed away in 2016. One of the saddest parts is that Tuffy stopped calling for a mate since it was placed in captivity. Either he knew he was the last of his kind somehow, or that he was in a container. He also never responded to recordings of female frogs of his kind. Maybe he also knew those were fake. He went out strong and became a legend among frog enthusiasts. At the beginning of 1987, only three Spix macaws were known to exist in the wild, and by the end of the same year, two of them were taken away. In Brazil, the Spix macaw flies freely in the thick Amazon forest. They live mainly in tropical dry forests and chill by the old hollow trees growing along the creek. Their main diet is seeds and nuts whenever they can find them. However, their numbers started to decline until they were no longer spotted. In 1995, a bunch of scientists went on a journey to save the rarest bird at the time. The job won't be so challenging since the bird's blue-gray color is so distinct that you'd spot it a mile away. During this time, only one parrot was alive in the world near a small town in northeastern Brazil. The parrot was first spotted by a German naturalist, Johann Baptiste von Spix, in 1819, which is how the parrot got its name. During that time, there was no record of how many Spix parrots were soaring in the air. But back then, he noted that they were very rare. The parrot was all alone during its years in the wild. It's extremely difficult to spot it and to put a tracker to see its whereabouts. However, unknowingly, there were still many Spix's parrots alive and well in captivity who have never felt the real joy of stretching their wings and soaring from tree to tree. After successful breeding, scientists have now released 47 healthy parrots into the wild, which is enough to kickstart the species again. But this time, the scientists were not going to take any risks and decided to put metal bands around the trees with hollow nests. This will prevent natural predators like jaguars or opossums. It would have been better if the last Spix's parrot found a mate and was able to start a family. Sadly, we'll never know. 
All we can rejoice in is the fact that these blue wonders are back in their natural habitat, where they belong. Okay, let's face it, we humans are pretty ordinary. I mean, we're no superheroes with superpowers, right? What, you didn't get the memo? But the animal world has a bunch of superheroes. Some creatures live forever, and those who seem to not care about the laws of gravity. Critters that are immune to venom, and those that can run on water. And some of them will send shivers down your spine. So the first superpower on the list is the ability to live without water. Kangaroo rats can get by without water for years. They actually don't mind living without any water. Humans, on the other hand, can only survive three days without water. Human zero, kangaroo rats one. These little buddies live in extremely arid desert areas and have to get water from the seeds and plants they eat. And although it may sound a bit disturbing, kangaroo rats also know how to extract water from their urine before they set off on a bathroom trip. This way, they don't waste a single drop of precious moisture. Well, that would come in handy at sporting events. Now let me introduce you to the Peter Parker of the animal world. Yep, seems like Spider-Man is real, but not human. Meet a gecko lizard, or simply gecko. This critter has a marvelous ability to climb up all kinds of vertical surfaces and can even go for a walk on the ceiling. This gravity-defying feat is possible thanks to the lizard's unique foot pads covered with tiny hairs. They can cling to almost any kind of surface, no matter whether it's smooth, hard, rough, or soft. One more fun fact about these guys is that they lack eyelids, so they always keep an eye wide open for what's going on around them. If you wonder how they keep their eyes protected, here's the answer. Their eyes are covered with a transparent membrane, the cornea. Sure thing, they can't close their eyes, and if they have something in their eye, they simply lick it off. Right, they clean their eyeballs by licking them. I guess that's another superpower. Any supersonic superpowers here? Sure. A one-inch long subtropical shrimp disorients its prey with a sonic boom. Despite its modest size, the pistol shrimp is one of the loudest marine animals. When the shrimp snaps its claws, it creates a sound as loud as a sonic boom. Naturally, this sound stuns the prey, and the shrimp can catch it without too much effort. Now, in the comic world, there's Hmm. venom. In the animal world, there's a guy that can be called anti-venom. Opossums are known for their handy trick of pretending to have passed away when a predator attacks them. But that's not the end of the story. These guys are also immune to rattlesnake and pit viper venom. The secret is a peptide that helps opossums neutralize dangerous chemicals. This is the reason why snakes are a favorite treat on opossums' diet. There's one curious thing they have on their diet – ticks. One opossum can hoover up about 5,000 ticks per season, and most of them are picked off their own bodies. Now, imagine a fish that is so notorious that it's called a dangerous fish. It's Mabenga, and it literally translates to dangerous fish in Swahili. This monster lives in freshwater and doesn't mind having a crocodile for lunch. Not a whole crocodile, but Mabenga can take a bite out of them. But to be honest, these guys are intimidated by the crocodiles, the same way the crocs are intimidated by them. Now, you're watching this video on some gadget, right? Well, we all owe the gadgets we have to the electric eels in some way. I mean, all gadgets have batteries, and eels contributed a lot to the invention of an electric battery back in 1800. I know, I know, the batteries have unrecognizably changed since then, but still, the first electric battery ever was invented thanks to electric eels. Anyway, if you see one of them and want to thank them for their magnificent invention, don't do that. Thing is, they can deliver shocks up to 860 volts. You don't want to experience that. Now, let's talk about the Count Dracula of the animal kingdom. Nope, I'm not talking about bats. I'm talking about the fanged vampire fish. These fish are known as payara and have two long fangs protruding from their lower jaw. Here's why some people associate them with vampires. Hippos are the beauty gurus, since they know how to save a fortune on skincare. Living under the harsh African sun, these animals secrete a sweat-like red oily substance that evaporates and keeps the animals' bodies cool. 
Besides, the fluid works as a moisturizer, sunscreen, and antibiotic all in one. But they're not the only ones with such a superpower. Mantis shrimp know how to produce natural sunscreen too, but they use it for eye protection. It's all about amino acid pigments, and these pigments act as special filters that contribute to their sharp vision too. That's what I call multitasking. Meerkats have dark patches around their eyes which makes them look even cuter. But these black circles aren't there just to make these buddies more adorable. They also function as built-in sunglasses. The dark fur on the patches blocks the blazing sun, and as a result, meerkats can gaze directly at the sky. On top of that, the sentry, a meerkat that watches out for birds and other predators, can easily see danger coming and alert its mates. Wild goats are famous for their climbing skills, but the alpine ibex from northern Italy is the champion. This critter can climb nearly any vertical surface, defying several physical laws in the process. Interestingly, the animals that do walk on the steepest cliff walls are typically mother goats with their little ones. Large males prefer to keep their distance and use flat horizontal surfaces. Eh, <laughs> smart guys. Some animals protect themselves with venom or nasty bites, while others use chemical tricks for protection. Listen to this. Some species of millipedes produce hydrogen cyanide and exude it when they feel threatened. Hydrogen cyanide is odorless but highly toxic. One little millipede can't seriously hurt you, but you may have burns or even blisters if your skin is sensitive. Plus, to make the picture even scarier, some millipedes glow in the dark. So watch out, and if you see a crawling spot of light at night, run away as fast as you can. When the bombardier beetle feels threatened, it sprays scorching liquid from the tip of its abdomen with a loud popping sound. As soon as the beetle senses danger, a chemical reaction starts in special reservoirs in its abdomen. The heat from this process nearly reaches the boiling point and also produces special gas that triggers the ejection. This super protection is usually fatal for the attacking insects. <laughs> I guess so. Plumed basculus lizards have an uncanny ability to run on water. First of all, their hind feet are equipped with long toes which have fringes of skin that can spread out in the water. As a result, a bigger surface of the lizard's foot comes into contact with water. Then, when it runs on water, it pumps its legs incredibly fast. This creates little pockets of air that prevent the animal from drowning by keeping it on the surface. Now, fleas can be annoying, but it doesn't make them any less amazing. These tiny critters can leap about 50 times their body length. If people could do the same, we would be jumping about a quarter of a mile into the air. Well, let's try it! <laughs> the most curious thing about fleas' astonishing ability is that they take most of the power for leaps from their toes, not knees. So, what's your favorite animal superpower? I vote for the kangaroo rat. I don't like standing in lines for the bathroom. Mm -mm. To see the strangest and scariest thing hiding in swamps, you need to go to France, to the nature reserve of Sting. If you go to this place alone, unaware of what awaits you, you will remember what you'll see there for the rest of your life, and it will haunt you in nightmares for a long time. So, imagine you come to these marshes by car. It's early morning, nature is waking up, and a cool breeze is blowing. You carefully go through the grass and come out to the green swamps. At this moment, you notice a silhouette. The creature is on the shore, leaning over the water. It looks like a human. It's squatting. Its legs are long like those of a grasshopper, and its thin arms resemble tree branches. This skinny creature is completely covered with mud and green algae. It's sitting right there, and it looks much bigger than you. You slowly step back in horror, hoping the strange swamp monster won't notice you. Then you see another similar creature lying on the grass. There are several of them. Your heart is pounding so loudly that you're afraid the monsters will hear the sound. Fortunately, you manage to get into the car unnoticed and drive away from there. You've just seen Homo algus, swamp creatures that consist of algae and mud. Yes, they do look creepy, but don't worry, they're not alive. They're statues made by one architect. She wanted to show the importance of swamps in the natural world with the help of her creations. 
People associate swamps with something terrible, but in reality, they're huge reserves of fresh water and a habitat for thousands of living beings. Life starts and ends in swamps, and of course, loads of scary myths and fairy tales appear around these places. The sculptor decided to combine natural features and creepy folklore into these statues. The color, texture, and coating of Homo algus change over time with the surrounding landscape. The next mysterious thing is the one you can only see at night. It's a strange, rare phenomenon called fool's fire or spooky lights. So, you're driving along a highway between two small British towns. The moon is shining brightly and you decide to go off the road and wander around a swampy area. You leave the car and notice a strange orange ball floating right above the water. This ball flies in different directions and seems to lure you closer. Perhaps it's a person with a kerosene lamp calling for help. Two more balls appear next to it. You get scared. Don't try to go in their direction. Otherwise, you'll get into a trap. It's dangerous to walk through the swamps. For centuries, people have seen this phenomenon. Many went towards such balls because they thought it was someone who needed help, but those who approached fool's fire never came back. Previously, people thought that these were some mystical creatures from another world, but today, science can explain the nature of this phenomenon. Bioluminescent fungi and algae grow in swampy places and can glow blue in the dark. From afar, they can create an illusion of an orange ball. Wind and water shake these algae, and it seems like they're flying through the air. Also, swamps contain many plant materials, grass, clay, leaves, and branches. All this decomposes and releases methane. As soon as this substance comes into contact with the air, it ignites and rises in the form of a fireball. Now, we're in Alabama, near the town of Prattville. Here, there are swamps that are popular among teenagers. Young guys and girls come here to meet with phantoms and some fantastic monsters. Of course, these are all fairy tales and legends people like telling each other. But sometimes, locals hear a strange noise coming from the swamp's depths. It sounds as if something heavy falls on something solid. So imagine a small town, curious teenagers, creepy tales and legends, and a place called Bear Creek Swamp. All these are the perfect elements for an excellent horror movie. And here's how it could start. In 2014, the county sheriff was driving between towns on a dirt road past these swamps. It was Tuesday morning. From the corner of his eye, he noticed something strange sticking out of the green water. He stopped the car, got out, and saw a creepy picture. Bamboo stakes were sticking out of the swamp, and 21 dolls were impaled on them. Most of them were porcelain. They looked expensive and antique. Indeed, this collection was worth a lot of money, but someone left them in the swamp in such a terrible state. Their faces and hair were covered with white paint, as if someone wanted to erase their smiles and eyes. The sheriff decided it was some kind of sinister Halloween joke and thought nothing of it. He returned to the office and told his colleagues about his discovery. Then, one of the police officers took a photo of the dolls and posted it on the internet. It became viral. The locals began writing to the sheriff's office, expressing their concerns. What if it was some kind of ritual? Who did this? How long will the dolls stay in the swamp? After this kind of reaction, several officers took a canoe and sailed for 30 minutes to get to the dolls. They couldn't identify their owner. The only clue was a logging company that owned the territory. The police tried to contact them, but no one answered. So they decided that if the owner came, they would return all the dolls to them. There's nothing mysterious in the most terrible things that swamps hide. These are not some mystical creatures or strange objects. I'm talking about crocodiles. And now, we will go to the one place where they pose the greatest danger. This is Ramri Island in Southeast Asia. While passing through these swamps, you won't see anything suspicious at first. But soon, you will notice that everything has become quiet. Too quiet. You'll hear a strange sound as if something is moving in the mud. The swamp around you will begin to stir, and then you'll understand that this is not mud and water. It's crocodiles' backs. These creatures are almost impossible to notice. You count several dozens of them. Each of them can reach 23 feet in length. This is almost twice the size of a passenger car, and their weight is slightly less than a ton. 
One reptile can bring a lot of problems, and dozens can cause absolute chaos. They are patient and extremely fast. They hide in the swamps and then suddenly attack you. Fortunately, there are almost no crocodiles on this island now, but in the last century, there were many of them here. In the 40s, crocodiles came across a group of thousands of people who didn't expect that giant reptiles would be waiting for them. Only a few of these people managed to get out of the swamps that day. In the Guinness World Records, this event is described as the biggest human disaster caused by animals. Let's move on to the most unusual, but definitely not the most terrible finding. It's called Swamp Ghost, and it's a big plane. In the 1940s, the pilot made an emergency landing in this swamp. He was flying over Papua New Guinea and hoped to land in a wheat field. Unfortunately, he didn't notice a huge swamp because of the poor visibility. The pilot and two other crew members survived the hard landing. They left the plane and were cutting their way through sharp grass for two days. All this time, they were walking through the swamps, fighting off millions of mosquitoes. Finally, they got to dry land. Locals noticed them and took the pilots to their village. After that, the survivors sat in a canoe, went down the river, and reached the road. Everyone forgot about the plane. It lay in the swamps for about 30 years, covered with mud and algae. It became a local landmark. Then, in 1972, several guys from Austria accidentally discovered the aircraft, took some photos, and posted them in newspapers. At that moment, the plane became famous. In 2016, an American rescuer dismantled the plane and pulled it out of the swamp. Most of the ocean is still shrouded in mystery, whether we're talking about dark corners or creatures that are hiding in the depths. But sometimes, it gives us a peek into scary things it hides in its cold, dark depths. Like when you hear on the news that there are some deep sea creatures washed ashore after a powerful storm once again. Some just look weird while others are real monsters that live at depths of more than 3,300 feet. The coldest and deepest parts of the ocean have created one specific phenomenon called gigantism. So sea spiders, squids, worms, and many other animals, mostly invertebrates or creatures without backbones, they're all way bigger and scarier than the versions we see in the more shallow areas. In the Pacific depths, you can see a sea sponge as large as a minivan. Or what about the colossal squid that lives in sub-Antarctic waters and is nearly 14 times longer than the arrow squid, a type that mostly lives in New Zealand? Researchers found many of these underwater monsters in the abyssal zone of the ocean. Back in 2021, the researchers showed images of the giant phantom jelly. It was at a depth of 3,200 feet. Its tentacles were 33 feet long. Wow, I wouldn't like to face that one on the beach. It probably eats only small fish and plankton, but it can swim to depths of more than 21,900 feet. And down there, this giant jelly doesn't have enough food. How does it survive then? Scientists haven't figured it out yet. And there are even more questions related to the giant squid, the biggest one ever found. This monster is 43 feet long, with a weight of nearly a ton. Imagine if those tentacles would grab your car, or something like that. They would smash it like it was a toy. There's no light in the abyssal zone. Sun rays just can't penetrate that deep. So there's no algae or underwater plants there. Local animals mostly eat snow. Marine snow is not like the regular one you build a snowman with. It consists of any small flakes or remains that fall from the surface of the ocean. Maybe even some leftovers that animals up there couldn't eat. So it's not much. But apparently, it's enough for very large creatures that hide deep down there, like giant squids. Squids that generally live at such depths don't bother going after their prey. They just wait until the poor animal swims right up to their long tentacles and falls into a trap. It may not be the best method ever, because not many animals will even swim into these dark, cold parts. But it's the method that saves energy. A giant squid eats only one ounce of fish daily, which is approximately 45 calories. That's nearly 50 times fewer calories than an average person should eat per day. So when a squid gets one fish, it saves it for a couple of days.
I hope giant squids won't get the idea to go to the surface and look for food when there's not enough of it in the abyssal zone. And I hope even more that giant Greenland sharks won't get that same idea. You can find them at depths of up to 7,200 feet. They're twice as slow as we usually walk. They swim at a speed of 1.12 feet per second. Their slowness is part of the energy saving mechanism that creatures down there need to survive. But they can speed up in the form of short bursts when they need to catch prey. But they kind of change their diet from predator to scavenger, considering their environment. There will be more leftovers falling from the surface than animals to go after. Greenland sharks grow just 0.4 inches per year, and they're mostly 20 feet long, which means they live for a very long time, sometimes up to 400 years. They also have a slow metabolism, and that's one of the main factors for their long life, too. Greenland sharks like to spend their time in cold waters. They're adapted to that since their tissues have specific chemical compounds that prevent the forming of ice crystals all over their body. That means they have some sort of natural antifreeze. So what makes them so big? Scientists are still not sure, but some theories try to explain it. There's this thing called Cliver's Rule that says bigger animals tend to be more efficient. Just take a small fish and compare it to a whale with a mass hundreds of times bigger. The whale has a greater metabolism. It conserves energy more efficiently and loses less of it to the surroundings through heat. Moving on, bigger animals can ingest bigger prey. They're more likely to go through tough issues in their environment or defend themselves from predators going after them. Also, the body gets bigger when temperatures are lower. The Greenland shark is a perfect example. So are giant sea spiders. Sea spiders are generally common, and you find some very small ones at 0.04 inches. But in deeper parts of the Antarctic, they become three-foot-long giants. They grow so big because the cold water has more oxygen. That way, more of it diffuses into the animal's body, and that allows it to grow bigger. Yeah, both as a creature and a nightmare. And how about this giant tube worm? Researchers found it accidentally while they were exploring the mysteries of the Pacific Ocean floor. They stumbled upon unusual hydrothermal vents. Volcanic heat is a thing that gets them going. As water seeps down through faults or cracks in the rock, these vents change their direction. When the water gets out of the vent, it's rich in different minerals and chemicals. Most animals wouldn't survive being around this toxic soup of chemicals, but not these tube worms. They came as a true surprise, because not only are they not bothered by these toxic vents and the almost boiling temperature of the water, but they developed entire ecosystems there. They're unique because they don't need sunlight to survive. Instead, small bacteria are their main source of energy. That bacteria gets their energy directly from these toxic chemicals. So it's not photosynthesis, but a process called chemosynthesis. And these tube worms don't have mouths. These bacteria live inside them. Strange story, huh? Plus, these scary worms reach up to eight feet. Giant isopods are no better either. They lurk at the depths of the ocean of 1,640 feet or more below, far away from the sunlight, looking like some monstrous wood lice. They spend most of their time on the seabed, hoping to find some food falling from higher levels of the ocean. Check out their small hooked claws at the ends of their legs. Isopods use them to remain more stable while moving around the ocean floor. Since there's no light, they have long antennae that help them feel their way around. These sensory antennas are about half the length of their body. Giant isopods have pretty big eyes compared to their body size, too. They can grow over 12 inches from head to tail. And these fellas are really patient. Remember how we said animals down there rarely get food? Sometimes they need to wait for years to get a proper meal. That's why their metabolism is amazingly slow. Five years later. They can go for five years without eating anything. Imagine that. I get hungry just talking about this. In 2006, 
A biologist did research to compare the differences between the shallows and the deep sea regions. He realized the deep sea mirrors the island rule. First, isolated parts of land develop biodiversity you won't find anywhere else. Second, small-bodied life there grows much bigger when it's isolated, compared to life on large land masses. Resources are limited, but also competition and predators. And we don't know much about these deep sea creatures. It's too expensive and too complicated to carry out such research. So we'll just wait for more raging storms to show us at least part of the monstrous world cold ocean depths hide.